title of my sermon this morning is Christian Dating Principles. Now, the last time I preached on dating in this church was many years ago when the first year I started this church. I, I preached five um, sermons on dating. I'm not going to preach five sermons again. You can go back and listen to those. But I wanted to talk, the reason why I wanted to talk more so about this one, obviously there are some people in our church that this is applicable to, but don't tune out just because dating may not be applicable to you because one of the main reasons why as well I wanted to preach a sermon like this this morning is I wanted to change how we think about dating. I wanted to change, you know, because there's a way the world does dating and there's a, a way believers ought to do dating and we need to change our culture like we talked about in terms of how we raise our children, how they go about dating. We as parents or we just even as friends need to know, hey, what's the right way to go about dating? How, sh how should it progress forward so that when we talk to our friends, we're not encouraging the wrong behavior? Because sometimes when people do it the wrong way, we sometimes as friends encourage them with the wrong way. You know, we're not telling them, hey, you shouldn't go about it this way. You should go about it this way. And, you know, we're trying to get people hooked up with boyfriends and girlfriends. That ought not be the case amongst God's people. So that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about Christian dating principles. Now, sometimes people think, oh, dating, you know, should Christians date? And they have sort of one way of how they think about dating. Um, and, and what they do in Christian circles is, you know, rather than just use the word that everyone knows, they have to come up with their own words, right? So they say, well, it's not dating. When Christians date, it's courtship. You know, they go, we're courting one another. We're not dating. And, you know, I, I don't, I'm not against that term, but, you know, people say, oh, you know, dating versus courtship. But to me, it doesn't matter what you call it. You know, you, you want to call it courtship, you know, and you're doing it the wrong way, it doesn't matter what you call it. If you're calling it dating and you're doing it the right way, that's what matters. So how you practice it is what matters. It's not what you call it. So what do, what, what do I mean when I say dating? So here's just a definition that I came up with. This is not anything I've taken. From, maybe somebody's defined it this way too. But when I think of dating, this is what I think of. I think of two singles discussing their capability, their compatibility. Sorry, no, their capability. Everyone's capable. <laughs> discussing their compatibility for marriage. Right now, I've chosen these words specifically. Sometimes today, in today's day and age, you have to kind of define two singles. Because today, you know, you've got, I don't know, they call it the thruple or the quadruple, whatever they're calling it these days. So it's two people, two sing singles, right? And why is it they're singles? Because unfortunately, today, people act like they're not single when they're dating, when they, when they're, when they should be single, you know? So they're single, they're talking, two singles discussing, right? So this is, you, you talk when you're dating, you're not touching. Right? Talk, don't touch. And what are you discussing? Their compatibility for marriage. That's the whole idea of dating. It's two singles talking about an end goal. But think about how the world dates today. It's the total opposite of this, isn't it? I mean, because this is what I think of dating, but then when I think about how the world practices dating, this whole boyfriend-girlfriend idea, it's the exact opposite of this. I mean, one is they may, they may not even get that right. The two, right? Then when they date, they're not acting like they're single. See, we need to be reminded when you're dating, you are single still. So dating is not you act like a married couple, but now you just call each other boyfriend and girlfriend. No, that's not what dating is. Dating is two single people and they are talking, right? They're talking about things because they're trying to see, do we actually want to get married and start also this physical relationship that leads to family and things like that. So they are single, but this is not how the world acts today when people are dating. They, they act like a married couple. They're talking, whereas the world, it's, what is dating all about? It's about the touching. Why do you get a boyfriend and a girlfriend? Because now you want to be able to hug, you want to be able to kiss, you want to be able to do those things. No, you should be talking, not touching. And what are you talking about? whether or not you are compatible for marriage. So there's actually a goal in mind. But when you talk to people dating today and you ask, well, when are you going to get married? Marriage? I'm not even thinking about it. I'm like, I don't know when I'm going to get married. Well, why are you dating then? Right? People date because they want to participate 
in what marriage is meant to offer, right? But mostly people that date these days, they're not even thinking about this. That's why they got it totally wrong. All right, look at what it says here uh, in Ephesians 5. Oh, we'll go there in a moment. I've just got some other things I want to say to you. So it's two singles discussing their compatibility for marriage. And like I said, the world has it completely opposite, right? Because the world's practice of boyfriend, girlfriend relationships. Now, boyfriend, girlfriend relationships is not something biblical in the Bible. Do you know what I mean? You go from being single to going to marry. There is not this transitionary step. And this is the one thing that I think we really have to take home and what's being practiced out there in the world today. And God forbid that it comes amongst Christians, because Christians do it too. Why do you think like people, like, you know, uh, you know, like even the, the, the Islamic world, right? Whenever we go out and we talk to Muslims and they're always like, oh, well, Christians are fornicating just as much as everybody else. Yeah, but that's the problem, right? One of the problems is, is because Christians are buying into this whole dating philosophy of the world and then they're fornicating and they're just doing things they shouldn't. They're acting like they're married when they aren't. And this is one thing we have to change, especially with our children as we teach them how to go about relationships. We want to have a good picture of what they should be doing so we can guide them and know, hey, this is how it should be done. And then we don't just blindly follow the culture. So it's not about two singles behaving like they're married. There isn't this transitionary type of relationship where you go single to, you know, like in Facebook, you're like in a relationship and then it's, it's complicated <laughs> and then it's like you're married. Those other ones don't exist, right? It, it, it's only single and married. So like we read in Ephesians 5, look, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. So you see, you go from being part of your family with your mom and dad, and then the man leaves father and mother and cleaves to his wife. So it's not he leaves father and mother and then cleaves to his girlfriend, and then they travel around Europe for a while, and then they, then they decide that they're going to buy a property together and move in and test it out. And then, then they decide to get married like 10 years later after they had like two kids together. You know, that, to me, that sounds like marriage. That's what marriage is. Marriage is then you get married and then you go and you might do your honeymoon and then settle down and have kids. So that's where you go. You go from single to being married. That's how it is meant to work. So what are some of the problems with boyfriend and girlfriend relationships? Now, obviously, that, that term we need to understand is, you know, when, when I'm talking about this practice when you say, oh, this is my boyfriend, this is my girlfriend, and, and just doing that, you think you have some sort of ownership to that person, even though you're not married. And you're like, this is my boyfriend, my girlfriend. I'm not just talking about having friends that are boys and having friends that are girls. So obviously, you can have friends that are boys and girls. But it's when, you know what I'm talking about, it's when people date and they, they start acting like a married couple. And that's the problem. That's what we got to get out of our culture is this idea that you're not married, but we have all these couples going around as if they are married, right? acting like they're married. Now, I'm not, I'm not against two people, you know, they're discussing things and maybe they're spending a bit more time together trying to figure out whether they should get married. But what I'm talking about is, is the touching, the kissing, the stuff that married people do. So what are, what are a couple of problems with this boyfriend-girlfriend relationships? One is that there isn't any commitment. There's no covenant, right? So the fact that you guys are doing all this stuff, yeah, it's fine when it's in the covenant and the commitment of marriage because then there's, there's less potential for there to be breakup, right? You've actually both purposely made a commitment to one another. So there's no commitment. There's no covenant. Now, it's not a sin to want to reserve yourself for somebody else, right? It's kind of like when you're engaged, you say like, you look, I'm not going to go date anyone else while I'm, you know, I'm kind of like hoping that this is the person I'm going to marry. But this is the thing, you want to spend time figuring out whether you're going to get married and not just spend ages just hoping this person is going to like one day commit, right? Because whilst it's not a sin to go, you know, I'm reserving myself for this person, you've got to ask yourself the question, why am I reserving myself for this person who, who has no commitment to me? You know, because that, that's what, think about it, that's what marriage is, right? Marriage is saying, okay, I am like exclusive and committed to you and likewise in return and that's what marriage is. But then people get into these boyfriend-girlfriend relationships and then they have reserved themselves for this person 
and then you ask the other person, are you, are you even thinking about this? No. It's like, well, why are you wasting your youth? Why are you wasting your life? Just waiting for this person to get their act together when there are the doors that may open. So, like again, so if you just commit yourself to this one person, you, you may end up, you know, losing some of your life while this person gets their act together. And how many times have you seen boyfriend, girlfriend relationships break up? Right? And then they've dated for like since high school. You know, like three years, ten years. I mean, I remember I, I knew this couple that had dated for like five years, like ten years or something, and they broke up. And I'm just like, oh man, that's like a third of your life that you guys fed together and you didn't even, you didn't even get married. Uh, and you know what? If Just think about like the fear, the fear of loss. You know, if, if you reserve yourself for somebody and there's no potential for you to possibly be won by somebody else, then that's even less incentive for the person to get their act together, right? Because they know you're sticking around. They know that you're not going anywhere else because you've bought into this whole idea that you're committed to them even when they're not even committed to you themselves. Like, what, what urgency is there for them to figure out, okay, well, I'm, we better make sure we agree with things, better make sure I've got things planned, got things organized, or... Whatever, and mainly I'm talking about sort of guys here because I feel like it's, you know, girls get approached, guys approach. So why do you want to, first of all, use up a lot of your youth with somebody who's not even getting things moving, but you give them even less incentive to get things moving when you're committed to them and you don't need to be? What's, a, what's a, some other problems with this no commitment, no covenant? This whole idea of try before you buy. You know, some people say things like, yeah, well, you know, when people talk about dating, they'll say, oh, well, you've got to try before you buy. And that is the most wicked thing that people can say because this is like a person that you're dealing with. It's not some, just some object that you're dealing with. This is a soul that you're dealing with. You don't just fornicate and try it and see if you like it or not. That's something that is really wicked, first of all. And like I said, if you're giving somebody intimacy, what incentive is there for them to commit to you? You know, it's like my mom would say the same thing and other people would say this too. Like, why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? Amen. People will always say that. So if you're just giving people milk, then why would anyone want to commit? But not only that, this try before you buy mentality, it doesn't even make sense because it's not like marriage just, just, just happens. Like a good marriage doesn't just happen. You know, it takes work. So if, if marriage doesn't just automatically happen, what does it matter what you're trialing? Because when you go through marriage, you're still going to have to work at it to make it work. So the past doesn't change what the future is going to be like. So if you have the right principles, which is what we're talking like, hey, you should talk together and figure out if you have the right principles, then you can make the marriage work no matter what happens in the future. But if you don't go about it that way, if you don't talk about the right principles and then you just happen to get along, this is when you start to discover, hey, when you're married and we didn't talk about these things, these are the things that actually now we are conflicted about and we can't actually resolve because we didn't resolve them before we actually decided to tie the knot. So it doesn't make sense to trial each other. Obviously, fornication is wicked. And, you know, delaying marriage just leads to an increased chance of fornication. So you don't want to spend too long spending so much time with one another because, like I said, it increases the chance of you falling into temptation. And, you know, another sad thing about just, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend, you know, uh, you know being too intimate together and going on all these nice experiences together is that y you didn't do it as husband and wife. You know, so it's like all your nice experiences, your first experiences together, you didn't do in the sanctity of marriage. You, you sort of wasted it all doing it in a relationship that you know was quite, kind of questionable. And you know, that, that is one of the best things about marriage. See, for people who are da have dated in the past or people that are dating and your spirit is sort of in tune with the Holy Spirit, you know that what you were doing was not right. He knew that, hey, you know, we shouldn't have been spending so much time together. We shouldn't have been going away, away from everyone else, alone. We shouldn't have done the touching, the hugging, the kissing, and all other stuff that people do when they're dating. And even though, you know, your flesh is enjoying that at the time, you know what's happening as well? You've got this burden of guilt. 
It's just over your head the whole time. It's just like, man. And it just, it just doesn't let you enjoy the full experience. Because that's what marriage does. Because marriage is according to God's will. So once you get married, that's one of the great things about marriage is all those things that you were, this guilt was tra- over you that you knew you shouldn't have been doing is now like, it's blessed by God now. Now it's something that ought to be done. And that's, uh, to me, that's always such a, a, an amazing thing about how, how can something, you know, because the world says, well, what's the difference? Well, that's the difference, is that one is now your, your conscience is right with God and the other is it wasn't. And it's sort of like that with salvation. You know, salvation, you have works. And if you put works before salvation, look what the Bible says about that. Isaiah 64. But we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So you see how when somebody's trying to be right, have their own righteousness in order to be saved, you see how God says, hey, that's filthy, that's filthy rags. But look at what happens in Revelation 19. Revelation 19, it says, and to her, it's talking about the bride of Christ here, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Look at this. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So you see how before salvation, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. But after we're saved, hey, our righteousness is like fine linen, clean and white. And that's what I kind of think of when I think about couples that are not married doing the hugging, the kissing and the fornication. Right? You see, you know, if, you're, if you have the right principles, you see a couple who are not married kiss and it kind of makes you cringe. Like, Man, they shouldn't be doing that. It's not right. They should be, should be married first before they do that. But then what happens after they're married? After they're married, everyone at the reception is like, ding, 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 ding. And they kiss, it's like, yeah! So it's something like to celebrate, right? Because it's beautiful. It's something great. But when it's done before marriage, it's filthy, right? It's disgusting. It's, it's filthy rags, like it is with salvation. So that's the first problem with this boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. Second problem is it doesn't excuse, like I said, the fornication and the inappropriate touching. So people seem to think that if I'm dating this person, now it's okay for us to sit close with one another. It's okay for me to put my hand around. It's okay for us to hug. It's okay for us to kiss. It's okay for us to walk and hold hands. Now, is it a sin in and of itself just to touch somebody, right? Like obviously we shake hands and you know, people hug and things like that. But it's just unwise. Why? Because what is it going to lead to? Right? The time spent together leads to getting closer together. The getting closer together leads to touching. The touching leads to kissing. The kissing leads to other things. Right? So that's the problem with people thinking, oh, well, we're boyfriend and girlfriend now. It's okay for us to do this thing. And you know what? If it's not condemned by the culture, which is like us, when we're not frowning upon it and we're just saying, hey, this is just normal, this is what people do, this is what kids do, they grow up, they get boyfriend and girlfriends, then we're encouraging, like I said, this culture of fornication as we, I preached about a couple of weeks ago. So it doesn't excuse the fornication, the appropriate touching and the kissing. Just because you call yourself boyfriend and girlfriend, that doesn't mean you should be acting like a married couple. And you know, why are you stealing the purity of that person from somebody else? Because that, that person, the purity of that person is reserved for somebody else, right? And then when you guys, when people do those things, you're stealing the purity from their potential future spouse. And if you're the future spouse, you're just stealing blessings from yourself, right? Things that you could have experienced under God's blessing with a clear conscience after you got married. So there's nothing wrong with desiring this. You know, the desire to want to be intimate with somebody else of the opposite sex is normal. But you've got to get married. If you want that, get married. Prepare yourself for marriage. Know what marriage entails. Get ready for marriage and then you can pursue that path and you can enjoy the reward of marriage that God created. Because remember, marriage was created before the fall. Right? So it was part of God's perfect plan in the beginning on this earth. That marriage and the joys of marriage and the pleasures of marriage, obviously, are part of that plan. So that's why it's a beautiful thing. You know, that's why, you know, the Satan has twisted it, right? Where even now you have, like, the Catholic Church just thinking it's taboo, like it's all taboo. But no, 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 like all that stuff was part of God's plan. It's a beautiful thing 
And it's just unfortunate that the world has turned it into this dirty thing because when it's practiced with fornication outside of marriage, it is a bad thing. The last thing I want to say about this problem with boyfriend-girlfriend relationships is it doesn't transfer the authority of the girl over to the guy. So sometimes you'll hear, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend saying, oh, we're, we're practicing her submitting to me. You know, we're just seeing like whether she can submit to me and things like that. And it's like, no, just because you call yourself boyfriend and girlfriend, that doesn't mean that you're her boss yet. Right? You're her boss when you marry her. And, you know, it's easy, think about this guys, it's easy to get along and submit to somebody that you're like madly like in love with, right? When you just, when they just captivate you, man, you want to do whatever for them, right? You want to keep them happy and stuff like that. But you know how, you know how a girl practices submitting to her husband? She submits to her father, right? That's how you practice submitting to your husband. If you can submit to your father and obey and follow your father and follow his leading, right? That's how you practice submitting to your husband. You don't, you know, like just do full on rebellious to your family and then think one day when you get married, that's just going to turn off and you're going to submit to your husband. Because guess what, ladies? One day, your husbands are going to feel like your father. Where like, they, you, you don't feel like following them, but you have to do it because it's right, not because you're, you're just in love. So that's how a lady is meant to practice being a submissive follower. It's to her father, not to this guy that is trying to be a husband but is not willing to commit to the lady. And likewise, the other way, how do you practice loving? How does a man practice loving? Well, he can practice loving with his family rather than practice on a girl that is not his wife. Now, what is the, what is the reason why people get into these unbiblical dating situations, these situations where they're a boyfriend and girlfriend and, and whatnot. One is, one is obviously people have no regard for doing what's right. So some people just, they don't care when they're doing what's right and they want to fornicate and they want to do all that stuff and they, and they honestly just don't care what uh, God has to say about it. Even saved people do that too. You know, they know they shouldn't be doing it, but they do it anyway. You know, so obviously that's one reason why people get, them, get themselves into that situation. A second reason why people find themselves in these sort of marriage-like relationships as boyfriend and girlfriend is because they want to have the marriage-like relationship but they're not willing yet to commit to a marriage-like relationship to have that reward of marriage, like I already said. They want, to, they want to do what married people do but they don't want the commitment of being married. So when I say somebody is ready for marriage. When, when you start the dating process and you're ready for marriage, what I mean by that is not that you want, just want to be married someday. What I'm saying is you, you are ready if you were to get married today, you could get married. Meaning you could go ahead with it, you could support yourself, you could move out, you could support your wife, you're ready to take on that responsibility of children. Because once you get married, that responsibility of children may come. So when we talk about somebody being ready for marriage, I'm talking about today, before they even start seeking a husband or a wife, they should be ready to be married today. Uh, or, or, you know, at least in the very near future, you know, because you don't want to be uh, dating for too long. And like I said, you want to be ready to start a family because that's the natural result of marriage. So think about this. If you are dating somebody and you ask them, well, when do you want to be married? And they say, well, I don't know when I want to be married. Well, then you know that person's not ready. Because if that person was ready, if you say, when do they want to be married? Well, they'd be, want to be married today. This is the, pro thing that, the, the thing that should be stopping you is you just haven't found the person to marry yet. But if you, had, if you find that person, then you would get married. That's how it should be. But if you are not ready to get married. You don't know when you're going to get married. You shouldn't even be looking yet. You shouldn't even start that process. Because what happens too often is people start the process, they get into these relationships, and now they're too intertwined, and then they can't get out because they weren't making the right decisions to begin with at the very beginning. What's another reason why people find themselves in these unbiblical dating situations? 
Another reason is, is that they're delaying marriage unnecessarily for the wrong reasons. So they might be delaying marriage because of their studies, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, or they're planning this huge celebration and it's taking like a year or two years to plan out. So I, I don't think that's ideal to take that long to plan out your wedding. But when people delay marriage because of study, I think that just brings me back to point number two, which is, well, that person's really not ready to be married. I mean, if you're studying and you in your mind are thinking, you know what, I'm, you know, and I don't recommend this for ladies to, to necessarily try and chase a career and things like that. I think it's better for women to want to want to be a mum, you know, but until you find that person, I think it's good to have skills and things like that. But I think that should always be in the back of your mind that if you get married and you settle down, it's much more valuable as a woman to raise your children, right? That's where your, your, your time should be invested. But let's say you've got this, like a guy has this idea, well, you know what, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave school, I'm gonna like get my apprenticeship, or I'm gonna go to uni, I'm gonna study, it's gonna take me three, five years, I'm not gonna get married until then. Well, then you shouldn't be looking for a, a, a boy, a, a girlfriend during those years. Because what, if you get, start getting a girlfriend in, in first year of uni, and then you go through second year, and third year, fourth year, and fifth year, you guys are just, you think, are you, are you so naive to think for all those years you're just gonna remain pure? No, you're not. You're not. You know, who are you kidding? So that's why you, you shouldn't just have this relationship for ages that where you're not moving it forward towards marriage because the, the temptation to commit fornication just gets greater and greater and greater. And you know what's funny about that situation is when people first start dating, when it comes to the physical intimacy, they're, they're more on high alert. Why is it? Because they don't really know each other that well. They're still getting to know one another. It's like they're not that comfortable with each other yet. So th there's not that tendency to just like, you know, unless you're just like fully ungodly, right? Where people just meet and they just jump into bed together. But most people, when they first meet, there's a bit of apprehension. They just sort of get to know each other first. And that's where there's actually, there's actually less risk, I believe, at the beginning to fornication because of that initial tension, right? Where people are kind of getting to know why they're a bit uncomfortable. Where I think it gets very dangerous for a couple that is dating, even proper dating like we're talking about, is when they have decided to get married and they believe they are compatible, right? And they're going to go ahead with it, but for some reason they're just delaying it for whatever other reason. They, they need to save up some more money at first or they need to do some study or they need to, you know, plan out the wedding. Now that period of time between when you say, you know what, we are going to get married to when you actually get married, I believe is the most dangerous time for temptation. Because now what you start to do in your head is, well, we're getting married anyway. So what's the difference? You know, what's the matter if we hold hands now? What's the matter if we kiss now? We're going to be kissing after we get married anyway. So you start to reason like that in your head. I don't know if girls do the same, but I'll tell you that's what guys do. That's what I do. That's what I did. So that's what you start to do. So it's better to, you know, keep the discussion of talking about things and then, you know, keep the contact and the even time spent together as a minimum up until the day you get married. So what should you be doing in the meantime? I mean, get busy with work, get busy serving the Lord. You can do other things. You don't need to be spending every waking moment together because you know what? When you get married, you will be spending every waking moment together. And you know that, that, that thrill that you get seeing that person? You know, give it maybe like a year, two years in your marriage, and that's gone. So it's, it's, not, like it's, it's not like you're missing out on anything. But once you get married, you're going to have all those excitement. That's what I'm saying. When you do it as boyfriend and girlfriend, you're just robbing yourself of your own blessing. Because when you do it once you get married, all those exciting first times, think about all the first times, things you did, all those will be there. But now you won't have that, shat, that guilt just overshadowing you the whole time, following you when you went to the restaurant, following you when you went to the Blue Mountains to go look, you know, the things together, went to do some sightseeing together. That guilt that was just always there, like, oh man, should we be spending this much time together? Should we be holding hands? Should we be doing all this? If you just wait until after you're married, man, it would be so much more of a blessing. And, you know, you will get to do all that. There's plenty of time. Man, when I think about how much time we had, you know, when we had even like one kid, it's like so much time. That's why when, when singles tell me they don't have enough time, 
Which is like, are you kidding me? You got like you're all the time in the world. Like you can like you can literally wake up in the morning, ten minutes before you need to leave, and then just get up and just go. Right? Whereas that doesn't happen with kids. With kids, you gotta wake up earlier so you can get them ready and get things packed and all that sort of stuff. Same when you're leaving, same when you're traveling places. So man, when you're single, you have all the time in the world. Um, and even when you're married without children, you have all the time in the world. And even with one child, you have so much time. Uh, like I think back to the early days of my marriage with Elizabeth where, you know, when we were in Phoenix, we'd just be like, we're not doing anything tonight. Let's just, let's just go to, to Walmart and just like go shopping. It's the two of us, you know, like at 11 o'clock at night because it's like, you know, she's just so free. You do whatever you want. Yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't happen these days. That day will come again, hopefully, one day. And then say, hey, maybe we'll go on a trip. <laughs> Never been on a trip since, uh, since we got married. Um, okay. What was I talking about now? Um, <laughs> The last one, the last one is, ah, the last reason why people find themselves in that situation is because they're just ignorant of a better way to do it. And that's what this sermon is uh, trying to alleviate, is um, that there is a better way to do it. There is a better way to go about it. Second point I want to talk about is finding a spouse. Finding a spouse. Now, you must actually find a spouse. Let's look at Proverbs 18. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. So I don't I don't buy into this whole idea of God just brought her along to me. You know, as if you had no part to play in it at all. Because if if it was all just God, God just brings one person to you and you did nothing. You know, it's just the one just comes. It's just like in the movies, right? They just come. They just, man, we just, where did you come from? Like sent by an angel, you know? Now, am I saying God can't play a part in how you guys meet? I think God can cross our paths. That's why you obtain favor of the Lord. But there's something for you have to find a wife. So if they just come to you and you don't do any searching, then what are you finding? So you, you have to find a wife. You find a good thing. So if it involves searching, that means it's going, to, it's going to take some work. It's going to take some patience. It's going to take some endurance. It's going to take rejection. It's going to take heartache. This is the reality of life, where when you want to get married, this is one of the trials and the tests that you have to go through in life, which is finding that spouse. So guys need to find a wife. What do girls need to do? Girls need to put themselves in situations where they can be found by a, a, a husband, right? So that's why uh, guys, obviously, it's, it's different. Guys have to be responsible, confident, be willing to approach. That's the sort of things that the guys have to grow in because, you know, these are the sort of things as well that make you a good husband and a good father. So I sometimes think that maybe the reason why God has it this way is because that's part of a man's test to see, like, hey, are you, are you, are you have the ability? Like, do you have... You pass the test to be a leader in the home if you can't even muster up the confidence to lead and find a wife and, and to approach a girl and all that sort of thing. So guys need to do the finding. But see, girls, girls shouldn't be doing the finding. Why? Because girls shouldn't be, you know, leading the relationship and leading the guy. And, you know, because if the guy, if you're constantly asking the guy about like, oh, you know, when are we going to get married? When are you going to get things together? Man, girl, drop that zero, get yourself a hero. Yeah? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, that's not the sort of guy you want to marry. Because the sort of guy you want to marry is not somebody you want to constantly be trying to lead. You know, you want to marry a leader. So that's why guys should do the fine. But girls, what do you do? You want to work on your godliness, work on your character. You may need to work on your appearance a little bit. Because sometimes girls, you know, you, you may be eating too much, you may not be ex exercising, looking after yourself. That's going to affect whether you attract a guy or not. That's just the reality of it. I know it doesn't sound very spiritual, but that is the reality of it, guys. Just like you want a successful, confident, responsible guy, this is what guy guys aren't necessarily looking for, like these confident women. They're looking for attractive women. So this is just how the world works. So don't, women go, oh, you know, that's so superficial. You're just after me for your looks. Well, you just after him because of his confidence? 
You just after him because you know he's a good leader and he like knows how to talk. Because because you, you want a guy when you're dating a guy like he's talking and he's you know he's confident. He knows how to lead the conversation. He knows how to you know order you what you like for dinner and you know, all that sort of stuff. You, know, you don't see guys going, oh, it's so superficial. You know this is just how the world works, right? The world works this way. And and if you understand this, then you can know how you can attract people and you can attract the right person. Obviously, if you attract the right kind of guy. He's not just going to be after your looks, right? That's the initial re attraction. But then as you start talking, your godliness is going to come through. Because you know what? It's the same girls with the guys. Even though you may be pretty, you know, you may be slender. But if you guys will be the same. Once you talk to that girl, if you don't get along, the, the, the looks quickly fade. And it's like in marriage as well. If you don't get along philosophically, if this girl just irritates you to the bone, you know, that, that beautiful woman that you were once attracted to just becomes a thorn in your side, just wakes up to you next to, to, and that, you know what I mean, that fades very quickly. So that's why character is what will last you through um, the years. So you need to find, so that, like I said, that means it takes work. Proverbs 20, whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing and obtaineth favour of, uh, of the Lord. Uh, that's the one we read already. Uh, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. Look, but a faithful man, who can find? Proverbs 31. Who can find a virtuous woman? So you see, these, these people are rare. So that's why it takes a while sometimes to find the right person to marry because these virtuous people, these people that are li wanting to live for God, wanting... Wanting to have a marriage where you're raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and wanting to serve God together, these people are rare. So that's why it takes some searching. It takes work. It takes endurance. It takes a bit of rejection as well. And it, takes some, it, makes, it may get you a bit uncomfortable. But it says, Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? But look, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her. So that he shall have no need as well. So somebody, somebody found her, right? Because the virtuous woman is married. <clears throat> what else? So I don't buy into this idea that God will do all the work for you. Will God's grace cross your paths to, to open doors for you and give you an opportunity? I believe that will be the case. But I think there's a response. God's given us a responsibility and a choice to actually go out and find a spouse. That's part of our responsibility, our free will choice. Now it says, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favour of the Lord. Why a wife? I think it's a wife because it's not the wife. Why? Because there's, there's more than one person out there for you. Yep. So I don't buy into this idea as well, that there is just this one person that God has made for you. You know, I know Adam and Eve was like, that's like a, that's like a specific scenario, right? He's like the only man alive and he made a woman for her. But I don't believe that is reality of now, you know, we have to find a wife. So this idea that there is this one person that you must pray and seek and just find this, this soulmate that is somewhere in the world for you, that you will cross paths and you will know them when you see them. Because that's, that's, that's the whole part, that's the hardest thing about this challenge of like one person that's you're going to marry. Is how do you even know who they are when you meet them? What criteria are you using if you believe there's only one person for you to marry? How would you even know that that is the one person when you meet them? Well, these are some of the ways people try and determine that this is the one person for you. Because you can't use God's word. Because we're not Muhammad with the Quran, right? We, we, we don't get specific names Allah referring to us saying, we gave you this person to wife. Like, I wish that was, because if I, could just, if I just knew, like, hey, go to Phoenix and find Elizabeth Escadio Ramirez, I would have just been on the plane, like, right there, you know, and, and not wondering about where I needed to go. But, I, you know, I don't get that specificity of direction. I'm being given principles, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So God does not identify this individual. Obviously, God's word guides us, but it doesn't specify our choices, right? It guides our choices. It doesn't specify our choices. What's another way people try and determine this one person that they should marry or find this one person is by emotion. 
right, by emotion. And often you'll pe hear people sort of spiritualize emotion as well, where they're just like, oh, you know, I was just God's leading me, this person. But then, how did you know, right? Because the only way you can know it's God's leading is if you test it by the word. And sorry, guys, that person's name is not in the book. So, you know, you just got to be careful. You know, I'm not saying that the spirit never leads us. What I'm saying is you need to test the spirit. You need to test these things and you're being led to something where you can't test it directly with the word. I mean, you don't know always, right? So, but some people, they just go by emotion. They just might say, man, it just, it just, just felt so right. How could it be wrong when it felt so right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> you, know, you know what? A lot of people committed adultery having that, that philosophy. How could it be wrong when it felt so right? Because things can feel right, but that doesn't mean they're, they're right. Proverbs 28, look, he that trusted in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. What's another one? What about circumstances? People use circumstances like, and to me, like, circumstances are entirely objective. It's kind of like, you're, it's like, you can think of all a multitude of scenarios, right? But let's say you're at work and it's like, oh, if she walks past me today, then I'll know she's the one. And well, what do you do in that situation? Now, you stand knowing where she's going to walk past because... Or, or you just read into situations, things that aren't even there. You know, it's like, oh, she did this. Oh, man, like, you know her favorite color is green? My favorite color is green. Like, let's, I know. We're soulmates. Circumstances. The last one, and this is probably the most common one amongst Christians, is how do you know this person when you see them, is, is through obedience. Now the problem I have with that, it might sound right to begin with, because the theory goes, well, if I'm sort of walking in the Lord, and I'm, I'm obeying God, then I'm going to get the sort of the right desires, and then like the person that I desire to marry, you know, that's probably God's will for me, because I'm in the will of God, I'm walking in the will of God. But the problem is, how do you know your desires are 100% right when you haven't been 100% walking in the will of God? See, if obedience, it's like with salvation and, and knowing you're saved. If obedience gets you saved or if obedience gets you God's blessing or if obedience helps you identify this person, when are you ever 100% obedient enough to even know that? So this is why, I, first of all, I don't buy into the whole idea that there is just one because you find a wife. Because like I said, even if, there, even if that was true, you'd have no way to determine that person when you found them. No sure way to determine so how do I think it works? Or how do I believe in the Bible it works? Is it's different. It's how it works is God gives us certain requirements. There are certain sort of minimum requirements that a person has to meet for, you, for that person to be in the will of God. And then once they're in the will of God, then the decision is left up to you. But let's just go through those requirements quickly. What are the absolute minimum requirements for you to know that if you're marrying this person, that it's not wrong, it's not sinful. The first one is, is that they must be a believer. Right? So if they're an unbeliever, that's already wrong. Right? Because you're not meant to marry an unbeliever. 2 Corinthians 6, look at this. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So this is about having very close fellowship with unbelievers. Now, there's no closer fellowship than a marriage. What does it mean here? Unequally yoked? So this is not the same, right? Unequally? What, is it, what does yoked mean? The Bible uses this term. A yoke is actually that wooden thing that goes across two oxen when they're plowing. So this is why the Bible uses this term yoked, because that's what they would have been familiar with, being farmers and whatnot. So if you remember, uh, I think it was Elisha, when Elijah found Elisha, Elisha was in a yoke with the last oxen, right? And he was plowing the land together. So if you think about that bind that binds the two oxen together, this is what this is talking about when it's talking about yoked. It's not just talking about having acquaintances and just relating with other people and stuff. It's talking about having very close relationships with each other. And that's why I think it's, you know, you got to be careful as well, even in business relationships. And sometimes business relationships can be really close as well. And you don't want to be too yoked together with ungodly unbelievers. It's better to find people that at least have same, similar principles, right? At least Christian principles, because that's why you don't want to be yoked together with unrighteousness. So it says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? So one is 
They have to be a believer. You cannot marry an unbeliever. Right? And it's not that we just want to put a da- God just wants to put a dampener on your fun. You know, it's not like, oh, you know, God's just trying to limit my choices and, you know, he's just trying to stop me from marrying the person I know is the right one. But the fact that they're an unbeliever, we know at that point they're not the right one. You know, because God is saying, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And you know what? You may not see it now, but in the future, when you try and make decisions for your family, like try and make decisions for your children, this is why it's so important to have fellowship in your philosophies because that's where conflict happens in a family conflict happens because of a difference in opinion a difference in expectation and especially if you do not even have the same religion you know that's going to be obviously a a big uh, conflict within that family so it is trying to God is always trying to do what's best by you sometimes we read the Bible and people with the wrong spirit, with the wrong frame of mind, they're reading the Bible and they just think, man, why is the Bible so oppressive? Why is it so like, oh, it's so patriarchal? Why is it so like limiting and God just doesn't want us to have any fun? No, 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 you've got it totally wrong. God is trying to have, give you the best type of life. And he's guiding you and saying, hey, this is the sort of behavior you should have, the sort of life you should live. And those of us who have done it have experienced that blessedness. And those of us who have disobeyed it have experienced the opposite as well. So it's not that God is trying to be oppressive. There are reasons why God wants his creatures to live this way. It's because it's the best. And it's the way that we're going to raise a godly generation. So number one, not saved. Not a believer. Number two is she needs to be old enough. For the girl and for the guy, right? First Corinthians seven. Now we're not given a specific age, but look at this principle we're given here. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. Now I used to think, and I think I was wrong on this, so I'm just correcting myself now. I used to think this meant when she started her menstruation, right? When she got her period. I thought, hey, when she got her period, that means she's a woman now, right? Because obviously she's getting in her period, she can bear children and whatnot. Um, and that was something I learned from somebody else. And, I, and it was, the idea was, well, the past the flower of age, the flower is when the, the blood starts flowing, there's this flower. Um, and that's the, the period when she, when she starts her period, her menstruation. Um, but the thing is, girls get their period when they're like 12. When they're like 13, right? So it just doesn't, doesn't seem right. But what I, what I think this is saying now is when you pass the flower of your age, if you think about a flower, you know, it starts from a seed and it grows and then it buds and then eventually it gets to a full-grown flower. But, you know, you, you can already start to see the, the petals forming and everything like that until it's fully formed. So when I think now, what I think now, what I think is right, is when you pass the flower of your age. What it's saying is that transition through puberty, right? It's the same with guys as well. When you start transitioning through puberty, you know, like guys, their voice starts to break, they start to get tall, they start to have on manly attributes, but you know there's that period of where they're transitioning and it's fully complete and it takes a couple of years. So that's what I think it's talking about. It's, it's when this, this person, this girl is actually a woman and this guy is actually a man, physically. Right? So there is a time where you can be too early and you haven't fully gone through that transition. Now, obviously, you know, parents are there to help guide their children and you know, obviously fathers that are there to make that decision for their daughters as well. But that's what I believe this is talking about. So obviously you have to be of a certain age. It doesn't specify the age because it's different for everybody. Some people develop later than others. But what it's saying here is you're past that transitional stage. Right? You're past that that, that puberty stage, and you are actually a full-fledged man or woman. And he's so required, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. So that's number two. Number three is you have to have the, fa- the father of the woman's p- permission. Now why is that? Because in the Bible, a father is able to veto, which means cancel out, the vow of her daughter. Look at this in Numbers 30. If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth, 
and her father hear her vow and her bond wherewith she had bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her. So this is saying that the woman is making this vow, but the father hears it and he doesn't say anything. He lets it pass. Then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she had bound her soul shall stand. Now look at this. But if her father disallow her in the day that he hear it, uh, not any of her vows or of her bonds wherewith she had bound her soul shall stand and the Lord shall forgive her. What is it saying? If, you, if she then breaks the vow, then she's let go. Because why? Her father had this, her father disallowed her. So this is why it's important to have the father's, at least, you know, he's not going to stop it because he is able to stop a marriage from taking place. If he disagrees with the vow being made, they cannot make that vow. So they have to get to a point where the parents, the father, will at least allow this vow to take place. Number four is the man has to be ready to leave his father and mother. So we read already in Ephesians 5 and we read in Genesis 2 as well that you leave father and mother and cleave to your wife. So that responsibility needs to be there. If the man is not ready to leave father and mother, then he's not ready to get married. It's too early. Look at what it says in 1 Timothy 5. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So are you ready to leave and cleave? You know, should you be working? For a guy, I think so. You know, if you're just studying, you're still dependent on, dependent on your parents' income, on your parents paying your rent and paying your car payment and all that sort of stuff, then you're not ready to get married. Um, so this is more so for a man, right? Because a man leaves father and mother, cleaves to He has to be able to support his wife. I mean, should you be in your own house? Do you need to afford your own house? You know, sometimes there are situations where people still live in the same place, but the guy has to have an idea of how he's going to provide for his wife. Um, and be responsible for that because it's his responsibility. Look, if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. If you do not provide for your family, the Bible says you are worse than an unbeliever. Now, some of the obvious ones is Matthew 19. Obviously, you're not currently married. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Now, you may think this is clear cut. You may think, oh, well, this person's divorced, so therefore they can get married again. No, they have to be actually not married, not just they you know, are divorced because they didn't get along, right? There needs to be for, because of, for the cause of fornication. Right, that they are actually divorced from somebody and then that person, they shouldn't be reconciling. Because some people are divorced in the eyes of the government, but they're not divorced in the eyes of God. And in those situations where they're just apart because they didn't get along, because there's irreconcilable differences, these people ought to get back together. So you ought not marry that person who ought to get back with their actual wife or husband. Why? Because you're going to be committing adultery with them. So you need to make sure that they're actually single, that they're actually unmarried, so that you can actually get married to them without sinning. And the last one, I won't go to the passages because we went there when we talked about the sin of fornication, but obviously there are, relational, um, um, there are relationships which should not marry across. So obviously you shouldn't be one of those incestuous type of relationships. We talked about brother and sister. You know, like I said, in the New Testament it is unwise even though it is not inherently sinful in and of itself, it is unwise to, for brothers and sisters to marry just because of the genetic problem. So I would definitely rule that one out in the New Testament as well. So besides those, so what is it? Saved? You, you're both, you know, of the, of the age where you're past and you're both men and a woman. Um, you have the permission, of, or you have the, at least the allowance of the father for the marriage to go ahead that the man is ready to leave father and mother, that the people are not currently married themselves, and obviously the relationship between them is a lawful relationship for those two people to get married. Now beyond that, it's really a matter of choice and a matter of wisdom. 
You know, you have a choice within this boundary of who you are going to find and who are you are going to choose to marry. Now, sometimes we want God to make those choices for us. You know, and that's why, because marriage is a very important decision, it would be great if God just made that choice for us and we didn't have to. But this is part of the growth. God doesn't tell you what shoes to put on this morning. God didn't tell you what kind of car to drive, where to live. You have choice in life. And another choice that you have in life, like what job you work at, is who you marry. And yes, is this a very important choice? It is, but the principle is the same. Where you have boundaries that you don't go outside of, but within those boundaries, you have a choice. Now within those boundaries, what can help you make that choice? Well, this is where wisdom and preference comes into play. So it might be you want to consider the spiritual maturity of the person. Right? You may want to consider, it may be looks. There may be a certain look that you prefer. You know, like some people just prefer certain looks to other looks. Some people find some things more attractive than others. You may have a certain look that you prefer. Um, purity. For some people, they don't want to marry somebody that has been with somebody in the past. You know, and that's just a personal preference because it's not a sin to marry somebody that has been with somebody in the past. But some people may not mind. So as you talk about things, these are the things you may want to talk about because these are the things that are important to you. Should they be important to you? Well, this is an issue of the conscience, right, and your own convictions. Um, you know, there should, I think there should be a bit of grace there if somebody is repentant and has done wrong in the past. You don't want to pass up somebody who is living for God now just for something physical that they have done from a mistake in the past. How responsible are they? Right? How organized are they? You know, is it somebody that already has like a mind to want to be a mom? Is there somebody that already has a mind to want to be a dad? Maybe you want children earlier rather than later. These are the sort of things that you want to talk about because these are the things that are going to sway your decision. Are they, fi are they financially stable? I would say more are they financially responsible because what is financial stability, right? Because you could lose it all one day. You could, get, you could, you could think you got all the money in the world and then you get sick. And then you know you don't have all the money. Or you, there could be a fire, right? And your house burns down and you weren't insured or something. And you lost it all. Um, so finan how financially responsible are they? What about the interests that they have? You know, maybe you, you want somebody that is into traveling or is into outdoor activities. And, you know, you're, you, know you find somebody, they're not into that sort of stuff. And that, you know, those are the sort of things you might want. So maybe these things aren't important to you. But these are the decisions that you have to make. Right, these are the decisions that we go through. Personality. Maybe there are certain ethnicities and cultures. You, know, you want to marry somebody within the same culture. Maybe your preference. Uh, life skills, experience. One thing I will say about all this is I don't think you should be a hypocrite about your criteria. You know, like don't be like you want somebody that's like hard working and you're like a lazy person. You want somebody that's pure and you're not pure yourself. Yeah. You know, that kind of stuff. That's the big one with guys. Man, they want to marry a virgin, but they're not a virgin. To me, that's a little hypocritical. If you pass somebody up because they're not a virgin, you're not a virgin yourself. So you want to, like I said, you want to be a bit graceful with people. Like, you know, sometimes it may be, they're not going to be perfect, but, you know, I think what you want to be looking for is somebody that's heading in the right direction. You don't want to necessarily find somebody that's arrived because who of us, who of us have arrived? But I think if you look for somebody that's heading in the right direction, you know eventually you're going to get there, right? So that's why I think the principles are what is right. And this is why this is so important. Number four, you talk, you don't touch. Right? When you're dating, it's about talking. Right? Because you're trying to establish compatibility. You're trying to see, do we agree on things? Do we believe the same way? Are we heading in the same direction? The, like, the goals of the guy, like a goal, the guy may have goals in his life. Like maybe he wants to work in this country or that country or he wants to go to this church or this church. You know, he wants to do these things for God. You know, maybe his ministry is not necessarily being a preacher, but he's like, hey, I've got this idea, I've got this ministry that one day I want to do for God. Right? Do you want to be a part of that? You may be like, man, I, you know, he might want to go into the Congos and you know, that's his call. It's like, do you want to be that missionary's wife? You know, these are the sort of things that you have to kind of consider. But these are the things you've got to talk about. Amos 3, this is the verse I always go to when I'm talking about dating or even marriage. Amos 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? So you need to agree on these things in order to walk together 
efficiently and spiritually. If you don't agree, how can you walk together? This is why you have to talk things out so that you can make sure that you are agreeing. So what are the other things that you may want to talk about that are not just like preferences? Um, and you know, somebody who is serious about marriage will appreciate the fact that you're moving the relationship forward philosophically rather than physically. You know, your red flags should go up when somebody wants to date you and all they want to do is spend time together and touch and hug and kiss. That person's not serious about marriage. Because somebody who's serious about marriage, when you say, hey, let's talk about... They, they may be ignorant, but if, they start, if you start saying, hey, let's talk about these things in the future, and they're like, hey, that's a good idea. You know, that's somebody who's serious about actually wanting to marry you for you and what you believe, not just marrying you for like what they can get out of it. Right? So... What are some other things? You want to talk, not touch, right? Because lust can be blinding. And if you're walking in the flesh, you're not necessarily talking about the right things. Some things, obviously, are your religious beliefs. Now, first and foremost, your religious beliefs, your convictions, your doctrinal positions. Why? Because it's your beliefs that are going to shape the decisions in your life. What, what church you go to, how you're going to raise your children, how many children you're going to have, how you're going to teach them, how you're going to school them, all that sort of stuff. It's your religious beliefs that will dictate that. And, and honestly, that's how you raise your children is one of the biggest sources of conflict in any marriage. Because two adults can kind of get along if they don't see eye to eye. There can be some peace. You know, one person goes this way, one person goes that way. And when you have kids together, and now you're fighting over how to raise these children. Now this is a shared responsibility. This is where a lot of conflict happens. So don't be duped by the fact that, hey, you know, this is like this whole boyfriend-girlfriend thing doesn't work too, because it's, hey, well, we get along. Yeah, you get along as boyfriend and girlfriend, but add children into the mix. Those philosophical differences that you didn't work out are now going to start to come out, right? So you better get those things settled before you have children, because once they come out, man, that's when the conflict happens, and it happens with extended family. Why? Because parents-in-law, they want to dictate as well how your children are raised, and if you are not on the same page, even before you get married, this is a conflict. This is a like a train wreck that's just waiting to happen. So you need to get on the same page. You need to be agreed so that you can work together on that. What about family future plan? I'm just giving you some ideas on some things that you talk about while you're dating. And remember, dating is about the talking, not about the touching. What church you go to? Family and future plans. That may be having children. How are you going to deal with extended family? Where are you going to spend Christmas and New Year's and stuff like that? These are the things you should talk about. Your gender roles. What does that mean? What is expected of you in the marriage relationship? As husband and wife. You should talk about those things. Make sure you're on the same page. You know, you may get married and the wife is like, I didn't, I didn't think you actually believed Ephesians 5. Right? I didn't actually think you thought I had to submit to you. Like, hey, I got plans, man. I got plans to be CEO one day. Didn't you know that? Oh, we didn't talk about that. We didn't talk about our career aspirations. You've got to talk about these things. Children, how are you going to raise them? Hobbies and interests. Past relationships is something you should talk about. Yeah, I know that's bringing some of the skeletons out of the closet, but I'm not saying that you talk about them in this order. Now, obviously, you talk about them in an order that you're comfortable with, and as things start getting more serious, then you start talking about a bit more in-depth stuff. But, you know, this is just a... Re I think a reality of life is you have to be willing to get hurt to find the right person. You know, because can somebody who's a wicked person take that information and do some nasty things to you? Yes. But I'm hoping through, while you talk to them at the beginning, you know, probably the people that are genuine about caring about you and wanting to do the right thing you know, they will stick around. The people, the people that aren't really in it for the long haul, I think, will eventually fall off. But yeah, there is obviously a risk there that you're going to open yourself up to some hurt or somebody else knowing some secrets that you don't want them to know. But I firmly believe that it will give you a very, a much better and a stronger foundation for the marriage that you're going to have if you talk out all these things and all the p potential conflict that could happen in marriage is dealt with at the dating stage, right? Because then if you don't get along, if something doesn't work, you can part your separate ways and there's no children involved, there's no, you know, families involved, there's all, you know, all that stuff. So past relationships, struggles that you have. Um, 
What about what if scenarios? Talk about like, well, what if I got into an accident or I lost my legs or I became permanently disabled? Are you still willing to be there for me? You know, these are the things I think, you know, we don't always know how we're gonna respond when the time comes, but these are things I think you should talk about to help just prepare your heart that, hey, we did talk about this, so if it does happen, man, I already sort of made the decision back then. When I made the vows, when I said, I'll take you for better, for worse, hey, that, I, that included that, because we had talked about it. In my own mind, it included that. Um, you know, financial scenarios you should talk about. Are we gonna share bank accounts? That's often a, often a source of conflict as well, where it's like, hey, like, why aren't we sharing bank accounts? Do you not want me to know like, where money's going? Do you not trust me with your money? Like, things like that. So these are things you should talk about beforehand so that you don't, have, you don't have to have these conflicts after. Now, can you get through these things in marriage? Of course. Right? Can things be worked out? But I'm just saying, if you date this way, I think there'll be a, it'll be a lot smoother path. And just from my own experience in my own life, because this is how I went about it, and, and this is what I believe was the best thing to do. And does Elizabeth and I have conflict? Of course we have conflict. Is there still things that we learn about each other that we didn't know before? Are there things where, like, in, in when we talked about it, we, we thought, yeah, this is how it's going to happen. You know? But when you actually go through it, it's like, man, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more overwhelming than we thought. Um, this is not exactly how we thought it was going to turn out. But if you have the right principles, you can work through it. But if you don't, that, that can lead to a lot of strife. So finances, how are you going to work? Like, are you going to let your wife work or not? You know, are you going to be, you're going to be the sole provider? Is she going to work for a bit? You may have different expectations there, different goals, uh, where to live. Um, what about how you deal with social media, yeah. right? You may be like, you know, your husband may be like, I don't want you having a separate social media account. And you're like, well, I didn't know you were like this, you know? So talk about these things before you get married. And you know, other background. So like I said, if you keep secrets from one another, I just think your relationship's not gonna start well. But if you don't keep secrets from one another as you talk through these things, then when you get married, you know what to expect. Because I think that's where most of the conflict comes from when you get married. It's just a, a difference in expectations. But if you know what to expect and you get married, then it's all about just executing on the plan. Does the plan not always go according to plan? No, it doesn't. But at least you've talked it through and you're going through that same plan together. Even if you may be overwhelmed with the reality of marriage, if you build it on the rock, right? So that's the most important thing. And so even when Elizabeth and I were dating, the one thing I really made sure of in our relationship was, is the final authority in our relationship the Word of God? Because if the final authority in our relationship is the Word of God, when we have a difference of opinion, we can settle it. Right? Because we can both study the word out and we can go back and forth and go, hey, what is the right thing to do by God in this instance? If it's not clearly laid out, then we know we can fall back on, well, there's an authority in the household. We get that from God. So then there's a, there's a decision breaker there. But if you go into marriage just thinking, hey, our opinions just happen to align. Well, what happens when your opinions don't align? How are you then going to resolve that conflict? So that's why it's very important that you both buy into the philosophy that God's word is the authority in your relationship. And therefore, when you get married, you will be able to make those decisions. So what, as we talk through these different things that you are you know, asking about and talking about, discussing about, and maybe even you know, changing your minds about, what ultimately are you trying to achieve here? Well, if you think about when we read initially in Ephesians 5, remember the two roles? The wife is submitting and following the husband. The husband needs to lead and protect and provide to the wife. So as you're talking about these, all these things, what you're deciding as a guy is, is this the woman that I want coming along this journey with me? Is this the woman I'm willing to die for? Right? Because we have to be willing to give up our life for this woman. So do you, li do, you, do you like her enough to be willing to make that commitment to this woman? And likewise for the woman, you need to be asking yourself the question, is this the guy that I can look up to, that I can follow, that I can respect, that I can tr trust to make the right decisions? 
right? So that's how it works both ways. That's what you're trying to decide. So when you, if you're dating a guy and you're like, man, you've got some concerns. He's not responsible. Like he's got some bad habits. He's a bit of a flirt with other girls and whatnot. Is that the guy you want to get behind and you want to follow? Same with the girl, right? If she's a bit of a, you know, oh, hey, why, why do you have any problems having guy friends? You know, I should be able to hang out with guys. What's your problem? You know, or like, you know, maybe she's not very wise with her money. She's very high maintenance. You know, every week she's going and getting her nails done and getting her hair done. Do you really want to have to pay for all that? You know, if you don't change some, some minds about things, the clothes and whatnot. So that is what you're trying to answer. Ultimately is, do you want to be married to this person? Are you willing to submit to this man? Are you willing to die for this woman? So then we come to the question of, well, how do I then I know, see, how do I know this is God's will for me to marry? Well, if you understand the boundaries, you understand you have a choice to make, then you know the person within those boundaries who you decide to marry, that's God's will for you. Right? So people always wonder that God's will for you is like this specific person. No, no. God has a will, which is his guidelines. Right? This is what he wills for you. And within that will of God, there are choices that you can make. So you can have peace when you make the choice within the will of God, like the requirements we talked about. That is the will of God for you. And it's no different. The last verse I just want to show you. It's no different like in the garden at the very beginning. In Genesis 2, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. So you remember God said, You can eat every tree of the garden, but there was some boundaries. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, was Adam there in the garden just thinking, oh, God, show me your, what fruit am I going to eat today? You know, you just reveal it to me. And it's like, I feel like this is the right fruit that I need to eat. No, like he, he makes that sure. He knows God's boundaries, right? And I know I'm kind of joking about it. And I'm not taking away the seriousness of the decision. But what I'm just trying to say is that the principle is the same. You have boundaries that God has set and you make that choice. And you can have full assurance that that is God's will for you if you choose within the will of God. So that's one main thing I want you to take away from today. And the second main thing I wanted you to take away from today is this whole idea of boyfriend-girlfriend relationships. We need to get that out of our culture. Yeah. Remember, dating is not about touching. Yeah. What is it about? It's about talking. Yeah. And you need to spend time talking once you establish that you are compatible for marriage and you're going to go ahead with this, make sure you limit that time together until your marriage, right? Because that's the most dangerous time when people start fornicating, right? So limit that time together to start planning out that, that wedding, you know, getting everything together. Make sure you're meeting together with other people. Don't put yourself in those periods of temptation. You don't need to anymore. When you've decided to get married, you're spending enough time talking and texting, you don't need to go sightsee together anymore. You don't need to go out and have lunch together. You don't need to go out and have dinner together. That's something you've already established that you're compatible. Now what you need to do is you need to figure out the wedding plans, right? How to actually go about getting married. All right, I hope that sermon was a blessing for you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. Thank you for the guidance that your word gives us. And uh, Lord, we wish it gave us more specificity. But Lord, thank you for the free choice, the free will that you've given us. So that we, there's so many different preferences in our life. People have different desires. And uh, Lord, you've given us freedom. You've given us all this choice where you've put some things in our core. Like you haven't just made us robots, Lord, and just dictated our life to us. We get some liberty. But I pray, Lord, that with this liberty comes responsibility. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to make wise choices with our life. Help us, Lord. Uh, because, you know, it's so easy to get in the flesh. I pray, Lord, for the people here. Help them not to be in the flesh. Help them to walk in the Spirit so that we can make spiritual decisions and, uh, Lord, make decisions that are ultimately pleasing to you because, Lord, we want our marriages and our families to glorify you. Uh, we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>